Hello. Welcome to this webinar offered through Dairy XNet, which is a national e-extension resource. Today's webinar is co-sponsored with the National Association of County Agricultural Agents. My name is Kathy Lee. I'm an extension dairy educator with Michigan State University, and I'll be today's moderator. The title of today's webinar is Better Milk Quality from Better Mastitis Therapy Decisions, and it'll be presented by Dr. Ron Erskine from Michigan State University. Uh, Dr. Ron Erskine completed his bachelor's degree in biochemistry and his DVM at the University of Illinois. Following work in private practice in Pennsylvania, Dr. Erskine completed his MS and his PhD at the Pennsylvania State University while working as a field investigator for the Animal Diagnostic Laboratory and as a self-employed veterinarian. Dr. Erskine currently serves as professor in the Department of Large Animal Clinical Sciences in the College of Veterinary Medicine at Michigan State University. His research focuses on bovine infectious disease, especially in mastitis and milk quality. Dr. Erskine, at this time, I'll turn the program over to you, and we look forward to learning about improving milk quality by making effective mastitis therapy decisions. Thank you, Kathy. And Welcome everybody, uh, present and perhaps future listeners. Uh, this is an honor to do this. It is a little different uh, presentation style than being face-to-face, -face, but um, certainly uh, enjoy the opportunity. So um, antibiotics are uh, at the forefront, certainly uh, for animal agriculture. Uh, there was just a release yesterday of uh, anabolic uh, or resistant genes in uh, bacteria being found uh, in samples from uh, pigs in China. Uh, certainly we know the, uh, the consumer's concerns. And uh, I guess just to set the tone, uh, I've become a great believer over the years that, uh, and I'll repeat this at the very end, but it's, it's not the drugs, it's how we use them. So uh, I, I think we have... In, in cases of the drugs themselves, many of the tools we need, uh, at least realistically, that we can do anything uh, with. And uh, so I think it's a change in philosophy, or at least an ongoing change in philosophy of how we use the drugs. Uh, you know, it's, it's always interesting. Uh, I get various and sundry um, old veterinary texts just to once in a while look at, and uh, here's one that's 100 years old, just about. And back then, uh, mastitis in this text name was called mamitis, uh, inflammation of the bag, not a very uh, pleasant term, but it's interesting. And even in back then, uh, the first thing that was listed as far as treatment or what to do with this disease was prevention. Uh, however, uh, perhaps horrifically so, uh, when you look at what uh, was being reported uh, some years ago, in this case a mercurial compound, uh, we might look at that and shake our heads and go, what were they thinking? But it... it better illustrates that for a century, and probably long before that, uh, there has been this overall draw uh, when a cow gets mastitis or a doe um, to, uh, <clears throat> we have this ready access to put something up in the quarter and hopefully uh, make the animal better. Uh, the question is, uh, have we really progressed? A little historical sidelight too, uh, when I first entered practice, well it's been over 30 years ago, uh, there was a, uh, you might say, the heyday of uh, available intramammary products. Many of them were copycat uh, penicillin type products, but as well as um, an overall mindset, uh, ironically, for as many products as are out there, that uh, they weren't good enough. Uh, what I typically heard uh, my first few years in practice was, well, we've tried the tubes, and this would be uh, from the producer's perspective, uh, we tried a couple tubes, uh, they didn't work, uh, so we really need that special uh, compound uh, or drug put into the vein or those special syringes, yes, I had those days, uh, mixing into the back room and uh, then putting up in the cow's quarter. And again, it was all under the, uh, the assumption that uh, there's something wrong with the drugs, they don't work like they used to, uh, so therefore we have to reach for something, uh, and in un many cases, uh, extra label. So as I mentioned, we um, 
veterinarians and their dairy producer clients alike, we tended to uh, get into all sorts of uh, bad behaviors. Uh, I probably used as much genomizin up in cores as anybody. Uh, that was quite the party until we realized that once you treat a cow uh, with intramammary genomycin, her kidneys uh, could be uh, uh, or, or in violative residues in the kidneys for uh, the better part of 18 or 24 months. Uh, as I said, there was a lot of compounding going along. There certainly was not sterile technique in making these products. Uh, we had no idea how these drugs are interacting in the same syringe or tube. Uh, and this all went on, I, you might say, uh, you know, with really kind of unchecked until the uh, Wall Street Journal article at the last day of 1989 that insinuated there are antibiotics in, in milk and supermarkets. The FDA could not confirm that with uh, HPLC, but nonetheless, uh, public awareness was uh, of the potential of drug residues in milk was uh, heightened. Uh, the result of that, a few years later, was Congress passing the MDUCA, the, uh, uh, the set of guidelines, you might say, to uh, um, how we would use extra-label drug use. And to great extent, that started putting us, I think, on the better path to critically evaluate not only mastitis therapy, but extra-label drug use. And I, I do believe the silver lining to that cloud uh, was that things have gotten much better. And if you look at, for instance, as an example, the uh, tanker loads of milk, both I know in Michigan and in a national level, that have been found with uh, residue violations, uh, that has certainly dropped dramatically over time. Not saying we can't keep on striving to improve, but that was a seminal moment, I think, in uh, many of us in the veterinary profession to start asking, okay, what exactly are we putting in cows and their quarters and uh, how are we doing it? So, that, needless to say, it, I, I think now when we talk about prudent antibiotic use, we really, uh, I have a hard time myself believing in alternative therapies, especially anything that would go up in the quarter of a cow. Uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the tanker loads with antibiotic residues have decreased, uh, especially as we know the testing for the beta-lactam drugs. The question is, here we are 20 years later, and we have to ask the question, well, how much has drug use changed? You know, has it changed at all on dairy farms? And what about the extent of extra-label drug use? Has that changed? And unfortunately, that's really tough to get a, a sense of change over time because there was really very few studies uh, done 15, 20 years ago to really assess uh, at least the, not, not just necessarily the drugs that are being used, but the, uh, the amount. Uh, there are more, a couple more recent studies, were uh, one done in Wisconsin and then uh, just last year came out from uh, Canada. Uh, the, the Wisconsin study was done in adult cows and it relied on a survey to um, ask producers, uh, this, in this case it was 20 herds uh, of conventional dairies and they're being compared to organic dairies, but it was a survey and uh, relied on producer recollection as to which drugs were being used and how. Uh, there are some problems with that in terms of you're, you're relying on the memory of producers, but it is still a, uh, a good stab at it. And interestingly, it came out to when we look at what is called a defined daily dose, uh, that is, uh, if you look at a cow, uh, one mammary, intermammary tube going up in her would be one dose. Say, uh, 25 or 30 cc dose, depending of, on her weight of XNL, would be one defined dose. Um, a little over 100 doses per week for every 1,000 cows. So you can change that to your herd number. Uh, interestingly, when all animals were looked at in the Canadian study, uh, there was a very similar number. Now, this is for calves and everything. What made the Canadian study intriguing to me was that they actually set up a system in, uh, I want to say, in the neighborhood of 60 or 70 herds uh, where they essentially dumpster dived and collected trash, all the uh, vials, all the mastitis tube, and uh, calculated from that the same thing, a uh, defined dose of uh, drug use on the farms. Again, little different than the Wisconsin study in that that included heifers and calves as well. What was intriguing, or perhaps a little disturbing, uh, in the Wisconsin study, uh, one of the questions that the producers were asked is, uh, 
what kind of drugs are you using for intermammary administration, or IMM. And 11 of the herds reported using uh, parenteral drugs or systemic drugs from a, a multi-dose vial in the quarter of cows. Uh, and you can see the list there, uh, ampicillin, ceftifur, genomycin in this day and age, still surprises me, and on down the list. Uh, from a veterinary perspective, there were still two herds. Uh, now, again, this is five or six years ago, but we're using uh, what I call veterinary magic bullets. These are compounds that veterinarians are putting up in the quarter. And, of course, sulfur, uh, trimethoprim combination, which is illegal. Uh, the reflection here, as I earlier said, is when you think of Amduka, and I'm not go into great detail on that today, but one of the founding or the fundamental guidelines to that protocol is that you first must not have a labeled product available for treatment in a cow. And I don't think any of these uh, products as listed, uh, at least from this study, would qualify. So as I began this talk, and, and my career uh, back 30 years ago, that we had this general belief uh, that we had this failure of therapy. And the implication was that the drugs just don't work the way they used to. Now, we can cite some potential causes for this. Uh, perhaps we do have developing antimicrobial resistance in the mastitis pathogens. Um, you know, there has always been a concern, I get, at least from some uh, parts of the dairy industry, that perhaps gee, we don't have the same kind of drugs available to us, such as uh, uh, our equine uh, uh, colleagues would have, or a small animal, or heaven forbid, even uh, human drugs. Uh, there's certainly a cow will only respond um, if her immune system, uh, and we're talking about anabolic therapy, uh, is going to respond as well. Do we have greater challenges with cows, uh, trying to balance energy uh, around the parturition and early lactation? There may be some validity to that. And of course, there's always a lot of finger pointing to uh, higher milk production. Regarding the antimicrobial resistance, or AMR, in mastitis pathogens, uh, some years back, uh, myself and others were uh, a small committee were asked to uh, report to the National Mastitis Council as to at least what did we know back then, now this is almost 10 years ago, uh, as to the scientific evidence uh, regards to uh, developing antimicrobial resistance specifically now in mastitis pathogens. And as you can see, uh, I summed up the, the conclusion of the study when it was all said and done that there wasn't any scientific evidence uh, to support that there was widespread emerging resistance among mastitis pathogens to uh, antibacterial or drugs or antibiotics. Uh, this is not to say that it's not there, but there did not seem to be uh, uh, great changes, at least over time. Now, particularly one that's been studied for a long time is Staph aureus, and that has probably been known to be resistant because of the enzyme beta-lactamase uh, to various uh, penicillin-type drugs uh, for a long time. And if you look at the data 30, 35 years ago, about half or a little more Staph aureus isolates were resistant to uh, unprotected beta-lactam drugs, so these be non-cephalosporins. Uh, and it hasn't changed to, uh, to this date. Uh, so at least from that perspective, and that's probably been the one of greatest interest, uh, and when we think of things such as methicillin resistant staph aureus, uh, there has not been a, uh, an uptick or a, a or very few isolates of this type of resistant organism found in the milk of cattle. There have been few um, what I call temporal studies. Now, you can go in on, a, on any one-day basis, and this has happened in studies all over the world over time, where people will collect numerous mastitis pathogens uh, from one or more dairy herds, plate them out, run susceptibility or MIC testing, but that's just one point in time. And, and you really, in many of these studies, can't gain uh, how is this compared to 10 years ago or 20 years ago? And that was part of the frustration when we uh, first reported to the NMC 10 years ago. Uh, 
Uh, the few studies that are out there that have tried to track mastitis pathogens over a period of time through diagnostic labs or in herds uh, have found overall uh, very little change with time uh, among mastitis pathogens uh, to a variety of drugs. And again, these studies, did, these three studies listed here did not look at the same drugs, uh, had different uh, formats, but basically it, there hasn't been a lot of change. The one exception might be a uh, study that was done by Makovec and Ruig uh, in Wisconsin that at least uh, there may be some developing resistance, um, not overwhelming, but uh, some decreases, or I'm sorry, increases in MIC, some decrease in susceptibility among mastitis pathogens for some of the uh, macrolid or lincomycin type drugs. So the overall take on it is as, as we're scratching our heads and if people are frustrated with mastitis therapy, it, I, I don't think there has been um, overwhelming evidence to suggest that we should blame antimicrobial resistance. Uh, likewise, uh, in this day and age, I don't think uh, with, the, with the MDUCA guidelines and public concern, I don't believe there's any indication to uh, suggest that the products that are out there, uh, if we choose our fights carefully, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, the products out there are are appropriate, and there's no need to be reaching for uh, non-labeled drugs. And we're the, I think we have to be looking over our shoulder a little bit and addressing public concern is if we step back away from mastitis for a minute and look at the uh, National Residue Program, testing program for uh, carcass uh, testing. Of course, this is USDA, uh, Food Safety Inspection Service, FSIS, and uh, as many of you probably know, uh, when uh, all different livestock species, class of animals are sent in for slaughter, uh, there is uh, scheduled testing, a scheduled amount of animals uh, done, but also there is a uh, inspector-generated testing. And that's where the inspectors at their choosing can identify animals that uh, they may be suspect you know, developing or if they uh, see lesions or animals that may look sick. Uh, they have, you know, they suspect had a history of uh, drug uh, treatment uh, that they can pull them out for uh, additional testing. And there were over 200, this is 2010 data now, but there were uh, over 200,000 samples, inspector generated samples uh, tested in 2010, of which there were 7,000 positive samples. Now that's on the screening test, but those are actually confirmed with bile to residues that would be above the tolerance in kidneys or in liver where they were tested. Uh, it was about 2,000, so, uh, and it involves 1,600 animals, and that means, yes, some animals may have uh, tested positive for more than one drug. So you can see uh, from inspector-generated samples, it was uh, just about 1% or a little less of these animals were found to be uh, positive. And so as we look from the dairy industry, and we're looking at these results, uh, and again, this is the inspector generated violations, but the two tall bars, and you might say the big two bullseyes that have been found in terms of numbers have been bob veal calves and uh, dairy cows. And indeed, um, this class of animals is picked by inspectors more often, and probably, unfortunately, part of the reason is that these classes of animals have had the highest uh, number of violations. And so what does this have to do with milk and mastitis? Well, as I'm sure many of you are aware, the FDA has uh, completed a uh, survey uh, that was um, started back, uh, well, last year in 2012. It started with 900 milk samples to be collected from dairy farms that had been repeat violators of uh, residue violations in, in carcass. And to match that, the FDA uh, chose to, as a comparison, to do 900 milk samples from dairies at large across the country. And there was uh, a whole battery of drugs that were tested uh, in this program uh, beyond, of course, just the beta-lactams. This uh, testing has been completed. Uh, initially, uh, many of us uh, here at the dairy industry thought we were going to hear the results in January. Uh, it is now... Uh, we think it's going to be this month in February. Uh, we're still waiting, and of course, uh, 
uh, everybody's kind of holding their breath to see what they find. And if you look at the, the list of drugs that is being tested, as, as I mentioned, it is uh, far more extensive than the routine every tanker load beta-lactam testing that is mandated by the uh, PMO. Uh, many of these are beta-lactams. Uh, you see a battery of sulfonamide drugs. But uh, some of these drugs are testing, and, and I certainly hope they don't find anything like this, would be drugs that are illegal in lactating dairy cows, including fluoroquinolones, uh, chloramphenicol, uh, drugs like genomycin I don't think uh, belong in a dairy cow. The drugs that worry me the most are um, oxytet, uh, sulf sulfadimethoxine, and uh, flunixin, or a better known generic, or a brand name is banamine. These drugs are labeled for use in lactating dairy cows. So if the label is followed, and that means the indication, the dose, uh, these are available to dairy producers um, to, to use in their cattle. Uh, I would suspect, or I would hope, these are the ones that are most likely to be um, discovered. I will go on record, I could be right, I could be wrong, that uh, Oxytet is the one that worries me the most. Uh, it is used extensively in farms, but also when it is used in a systemic fashion, uh, IM, IV, even intrauterus, uh, this drug has the ability to distribute very well into the mammary gland in higher concentrations than perhaps some other drugs that are used. So we have in the background this uh, FDA survey. And uh, getting back to mastitis, one of the uh, realizations about the therapy for mastitis is that this remains the largest cause of antimicrobial drug use in dairy cows. And so if we target making better choices uh, of using this class of drugs or any drug uh, in the therapy of mastitis, we, and if we can reduce that by making better choices, we stand to, to uh, really make a good progress in reducing the amount of drugs that are used in, in the dairy industry, especially in adult cows. I am not a pharmacologist, but what I have tried to put together from a uh, farm side point of view is to uh, understand a little bit better how antibiotics uh, work. And one of the key things I've had to accept is that just because as a practitioner, I put an antibiotic in a cow that the, the drug does not distribute through the cow and vaporize all the bacteria. Uh, what really clears infections, and mastitis is no different, is the immune system, and specifically the white blood cells or the phagocytes that engulf and hopefully kill the ingested bacteria. So number one, we, we need that incompetent immune system we mentioned earlier and some of the challenges we do have around those fresh cows. Uh, number two, we know that phagocytes, neutrophils, uh, macrophages do not function as well in their killing abilities. These are bacteria and pathogens uh, in the mammary gland as they do in other tissues. There's a variety of reasons, but we already have our foot in the bucket, you, you might say, as soon as we're treating a mastitis. And so it's important to realize that what the antibiotics do is help level the playing field for uh, the immune system. Bacteria are notorious if they're given the right conditions of doubling their numbers every 20 to 30 minutes. They can quickly uh, divide and multiply. It takes time for the immune system to uh, get through inflammation, to recruit cells into the gland, to fight the infection. It takes several days for the lymphocytes to uh, activate and go through clonal expansion, antibody production. So antibox, you might say, from my point of view anyway, help buy time to inhibit bacterial growth while the immune system can get or get the job done. There are two, this is a simplification, but there are two basic ways in how antibox might inhibit bacterial growth. One is concentration dependent, and as the name would imply, the higher the concentration of drug you get at the site of infection, uh, the better it is. At least this is relative to the MIC, or minimum inhibitory concentration. This is the minimum amount of drug you need to help inhibit bacterial growth. And in concentration-dependent inhibition, you would want peak serum, or perhaps better said, peak concentrations at the site of infection, 
eight to ten times greater than the MIC. It's the, it's the big bomb approach. However, when we look at adult dairy cows, we have in the U.S. no labeled products for a cow, and some are illegal, that uh, work by this mechanism. And so as we talk about choices for mastitis or, for that matter, any other bacterial infection in the adult dairy cow, we are really talking about antibiotics that are time-dependent inhibition. And what this means is that it's not how high you go, it's how long you stay above the MIC, kind of like the tortoise and the hare. Uh, long, slow, steady exposure of that drug to the, the pathogen so the immune system can do its job. And this is a, at the crux of how we have to treat dairy cattle uh, for mastitis. One of the two uh, cornerstones of applying this concept of time-dependent inhibition to anabolic therapy uh, and, and how we might practically have to deal with this in the barnyard are dose intervals and duration of therapy. Uh, the top study I cited, yes, I realize it's 25 years old or more. Uh, I want to point out that chloramphenicol that was used in this study, this Canadian study, was is now certainly illegal, but the simplicity of the study drives home the point. And that is, when in this study you had Holstein calves with pneumonia, these calves were either treated once a day or twice a day with this antibiotic, the calves that were treated once a day had four times the death loss as those calves that were treated twice a day. And if you think about that, it's simply because with the inconvenience of going out and administering that antibiotic therapy to those animals a second time each day, they were more consistently able to keep the drug concentration above the MIC, that is, above that high bar for this time-dependent in inhibitor, that is, chloramphenicol. Now, fortunately, as I said, this study has a little date to it, but the manufacturers, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, when we look at some of the drugs that have come out available for um, cattle uh, the last 10, 15 years, many of these have addressed uh, this dose interval need, and most of them uh, are able to maintain effective concentrations with once-a-day dosing, in some cases every other two or three days. Uh, so the concept is there, but that has been addressed with uh, different products. Perhaps when we look at our failure of therapy, and particularly mastitis therapy, the greater question we might ask is about duration. And this, too, plays into that time-dependent inhibiting concept. If you look at the text, uh, and again, uh, the people who know a lot more about pharmacology than I do, but uh, when you look at the textbooks on veterinary pharmacology, they are clear that as they describe treating a bacterial infection with uh, antibiotics, the uh, overall recommendation is that we should treat at least two days after clinical and or microbiological resolution. That is, two days after the animal looks better. Severe cases may be a week or more. Chronic may involve months. And that, of course, uh, is very typical to do on a typical dairy. But where this comes back to is that if you ask a typical dairy producer, do you treat, for instance, a mastitis, clinical mastitis, for at least two days after that cow's milk looks normal, most of the time, uh, they'll shake their head or think that uh, <laughs> you're really off target. The, um, and yet, as I said before, we are dealing with an infection that has, in essence, an impaired immune system in the mammary gland, and we're ignoring what the pharmacologists tell us is the best therapy for these cows. I, I liken the analogy to that uh, if I went to uh, or developed bronchopneumonia during the flu season, and uh, went to my physician, got a prescription for antibiotics, went to the pharmacy, picked it up, and there were only two pills in that amber vial, and I rattled them around, and one pill for tonight and one pill for tomorrow morning, I would think I got gypped, and I would go back to the pharmacist and say, wait a minute, uh, two pills, don't you mean that should have been a 20? And, and uh, they said, nope, that's what the physician wrote. I would hope uh, that I have enough sense maybe to find another physician. So we have to think a little bit 
about what kind of conflict we have between what is good pharmacology and what is the economic drive to get these cows back into the tank. And indeed, when you look at some of the, uh, uh, what's put on the labels uh, of some of the products that are labeled for cows, this is uh, ampicillin trihydrate, better known as Polyflex. Right on the label, the manufacturer stated, three days treatment is usually adequate, but we should continue treatment for at least another two or three, uh, two or three days after the animal no longer has a fever. Uh, ampicillin trihydrate, this is again a time-dependent inhibitor. Uh, is this manufacturer necessarily trying to just sell more drug? Well, perhaps that's a suspicion, but the reality is if we're going to follow good pharmacologic principles, this is the proper way to treat infections right the first time. And there has been numerous studies, uh, Tennessee, uh, the UK, uh, that have, and other places that have looked at extended mastitis therapy. Now, extended being beyond the usual uh, two treatments or two or three milkings. Uh, in this case, it was ceftiofur. Uh, and as you can see, the uh, control cows, so those that were not treated, only about 10% cured. Uh, and the longer you treated these cows up to eight days, the greater the, uh, the percent cured. Among the eight-day group, the, the pathogens that are listed down there at the bottom of the slide, uh, Again, Staph aureus is always a tough nut to crack, only successful about 36% of the time or a third of the time. However, when we look at some of the gram-positive cocci, the strep uberus, the discolactia, the coagulase-negative staph, or the CNS, now we are starting to hit that 70, 80, perhaps even 85% cure rate that long ago we thought uh, we should have been getting with the mastitis tubes, but we never got. How did we achieve this, or how can we possibly attain this, is that maybe we should realize these drugs are time-dependent inhibitors, and we have to, in certain cases, extend the therapy. Now, um, when people ask, well, should we uh, you know, extend our therapy? We're treating for X number of tubes. Should we treat for more? My, my first comment is, well, do you know your cure rates or your relapse rates in your herd even before we change? Uh, has anybody even kept proper records so I know where we're starting from? Are you getting 20% of your cases, uh, do they relapse again? Is it 40? Is it 60? Uh, I, I need a basis for that. And as we'll also talk a little bit, we'll talk about a little bit about bacterial identification. But one of the concerns I do have uh, is the um, proper sanitation of the teat end before we put anything, including a cannula, up in that teat. I have a growing suspicion that this is not done properly on many herds. There was a Canadian study that came out this past fall in Journal Dairy Science linking improper infusion techniques with prototheca intermammary infections. Uh, from the farm point of view, I can't hardly blame uh, some of the people treating cows when you look at the inconvenience of the way these Alcohol uh, budgets are, uh, are wrapped in the tin foil, and I think we need to do a better way on many farms to find a more convenient way to get alcohol in these teat ends of cows. So, and in fact, if you look at uh, boxes of Pursue or Perlomycin, the manufacturer has a warning in their uh, label saying that if you do not use absolute scrupulous clean technique to infuse these cows, uh, as you extend the therapy, so you're increasing the chance for bringing something there, you do run a small but significant risk of bringing in an environmental sort of contaminant and in, in infection. And then finally, when we look at mastitis therapy from uh, this, this frustration that the intermammary tubes aren't working, uh, many of us over the years have tried to reach for systemic therapy as well. Now, I'm going to hold systemic, or I'm sorry, severe clinical mastitis in a separate little pool. But as we look at most of the clinical mastitis, the mild to moderate cases, limited to the mammary gland, and if we start selecting drugs to pop into the muscle or the vein or sub-Q into the cow, uh, 
we must realize that many of these drugs do not distribute very well into the mammary gland. The udder is a strong barrier to many drugs to distribute from the blood into the milk, if you will. And here is a uh, table of drugs that um, lists the relative concentration of a drug that you'll have in milk relative to plasma or blood. And so, for instance, ceftiofur, there's a reason why you can give a cow a shot of XNL today and use her milk today because very little of that drug um, crosses that barrier. You may have a fine concentration to treat a uh, pneumonia, but uh, not so for treating a mastitis. And on down the list, uh, sulfonamides, your beta-lactams, all these drugs do not really distribute and accumulate in the utter very well and likely to be as a, uh, a benefit for therapy. As I mentioned earlier, the one exception, at least to commonly used drugs in dairy cattle, would be tetracycline. That drug has the ability to, um, at very least, probably be an equal distribution in the udder relative to blood, and in some cases may be higher. So if those are kind of the rules for better understanding of how the antibiotics work and distribute, how can we apply this then and, and finally make some better decisions uh, for the uh, therapy of cows? First on our list should be that we need to find better ways in the farm to stop treating the repeat offenders. These cows that have long duration of infection, uh, infection, generally the older cows, greater lactation number, the cows with higher SMAC cell counts, multiple infected quarters, these have all been identified from numerous studies as risks for poor therapeutic outcome. And I think it's fair to say by the time you treat a cow for the second time, definitely the third time, the chance of succeeding are quite slim. And unfortunately, too many herds get into this trap of because they don't follow the relapses or keep good records or refer to the records of treating some of these cows over and over again. The other critical uh, part of this is there are numerous pathogens that can get up in the core of a cow, unfortunately, uh, that will respond very poorly to any antibiotic. I don't care if it's one of the label products or something off the shelf. Uh, mycotic organisms, prototheca, which is an algae, uh, as you can see on the list, pseudomonas, mycoplasma, and, and some of the others listed there all have um, very poor therapeutic outcome. I think we've tried too long to find some of the other exotic drugs in years past. If we continue to try to treat chronic cases, and if, almost embarrassingly, we find out later that it has been one of these pathogens, that has been a double loss. So we have to address the chronic offenders. We have to find tools uh, so that we're not trying to treat mastitis cases from pathogens we can't treat to begin with. This is... Uh, slide I got from Steve Nickerson when he was still down at Louisiana State some years ago. And uh, it's still one of my favorites. Uh, this is a cross-section of an udder uh, to your left on that slide. The green part is a uh, uh, the front quarter. And the uh, you see that nice almost line between the two is the rear quarter. Uh, if these cows, or this cow, before she was euthanized, was uh, infused with uh, a green dye about the same volume as a mastitis tube. And as you can see from the arrows, the in the front quarter, the green dye distributed fairly well throughout the uh, quarter. So if that green dye were an antibiotic instead, it would have fairly good diffusion into the tissue of that gland. In the rear quarter, you can see that that green dye pretty much stayed in the uh, ducts and the gland cistern uh, did not get out in, in to disseminate into the tissue very, uh, or, well, virtually at all. Uh, this rear quarter was uh, a chronic infected or chronically infected staph aureus quarter. And this drives home the point when we try to treat chronic infections and we have the abscess formation, we have the fibrin or scar tissue formation, uh, we are not likely to affect good therapy and this quarter would be better dried off, or the cow dried off, or perhaps cold, rather than keep on using antibiotics to no effect. And so, not that this is made to be the, the ultimate um, plan, but as a, as a general 
guideline. Uh, here is a uh, an idea, for instance, that has been put out there using culture-based therapy, uh, particularly for mild clinical mastitis. And you can see the decision tree. If we decide the cow is chronic, we won't treat her. If uh, we find out from culture that is some organism, as we mentioned earlier, that's not going to be uh, likely to be successful, we won't treat her. Uh, Gram pauses in general, uh, they probably deserve a, an attempt. Coliforms, there have been studies uh, for, uh, for and against, and I think that's uh, highly herd dependent. And there have been studies to support this approach. Uh, that is that if you have a cow with mild clinical mastitis, you'll wait 24 hours, get the culture. Uh, as originally done in a large dairy in Michigan some years back, they uh, cut the antibiotic use by 80% following a guideline that's very similar to that decision tree in the previous slide. However, this herd has uh, it's tied into Michigan State, has two, actually three full-time veterinarians now, a laboratory. Uh, when uh, Sarah Wagner and I tried this in a small, another study in four herds, uh, those herds, two of the four herds that stayed with the plan, it worked well. The other two herds uh, didn't work at all, but we quickly found out that culture-based therapy is very much dependent on somebody who's going to own this program on the herd and run with it. Now, the more recently, the largest and perhaps more successful study was found uh, in a multi-state uh, study uh, with LAGO and, and others, uh, in which they found that culture-based therapy reduced antibiotic use by 50%. And perhaps just as important, people may ask, well, what's the cost? If we don't treat that cow for 24 hours, we must lose something. Well, uh, in this study, this multi-state study, when they... Uh, looked at long-term effects on lactation, uh, whether or not that cow was removed from the herd, how long it was before she was moved from the herd, the relapse rate, uh, cell count, linear smack cell count, all across the board, that uh, there was no um, detriment to waiting that day, getting the culture, and then deciding to treat that cow. So, in other words, it didn't cost that cow to wait, and you reduced, and those cows that you decided to treat, uh, you know, by waiting a day, it didn't matter, and you eliminated half the cows that uh, from treatment because you realized that they just didn't fit the model. And finally, as I just want to reiterate, and I mentioned this earlier, this is not applicable to severe clinical cases. So cows that are systemically ill, uh, they need immediate therapy. Uh, I put in big bold letters fluids for a reason. That is the most important thing that they should receive. Uh, Anti-inflammatory drugs perhaps intramammary as well as systemic antibiotics. This would be the one situation it may be beneficial because many of these cows are bacteremic. That is, they have bacteria in their blood. Uh, but there's no reason not to still collect the culture and then uh, as going forward on these cows, day two, three, and four, to make a better decision on, uh, based on the culture of how you want to continue therapy for that cow. So I hope uh, this has been a, a, a wide survey of an approach to mastitis therapy and how we can make better decisions. But as I said way back at the beginning, I just want to reiterate that uh, it's not the drugs, uh, as I so wrongly thought 30 years ago, but it's how we use them. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ron. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about um, on-farm culturing and, and how people might make a decision whether on-farm far culturing would, would work for them. Sure. Um, well, as I said, Kathy, the, uh, the first thing I've realized uh, as I've tried to, um, you know, we've run some short courses now here in, in Michigan, and I know an NMC has and, and other uh, uh, places that you have to identify somebody in the herd who's going to um, uh, take ownership of it. The other thing, I, I think it's an opportunity for veterinarians or extension personnel to follow up with the farm, uh, continue coaching. Uh, we see many times people will want to get a hold of this, they go home, and then they run into some frustration because things aren't quite going uh, on the plates the way that they expected or they're not sure if they're interpreting them right. And then they get frustrated, and that leads to giving up on it. So uh, I, uh, I believe that the follow-up is very important. But as far as the type of herd that would do it, I, I would say that uh, uh, any herd that's treating mastitis, at least where they feel they're treating uh, 
and I'm not talking severe cases, but the mild cases, and unless they feel that uh, their relapse rate is under 20 or 25 uh, percent, A, either they should back off treating altogether, and maybe that comes along with looking at records in the chronic cows, or instituting culture just to uh, make sure that uh, they're, they're picking the appropriate infections. That would be the staph and strep. I'll just say the other thing that culture can get, even if the farm may not isolate it, if they see strange things, and strange things would be non-staph, non-strep, non-coliforms, that's where they might want to send an isolate or two into their vet practice or diagnostic lab just to pick up and make sure they're not finding uh, things like yeast infections or pseudomonas that might point to a point source of infection. Okay. Uh, we have a question here. What are the tests that you're using on the farms, um, Petri film, three-plate, uh, others? Yeah, there, there are a variety of, and yeah, there are a variety of products. I, I think whatever you're comfortable with. The ones that we train, we tend to train uh, simple first, uh, and that is just a simple biplate, uh, blood auger, McConkie's, um, because we want to start with fundamentals. Uh, we will try to get the farms to, um, if they can run a simple coagulase, it's not hard to identify Staph aureus. Uh, there are blood plates with esculin in there, so you might be able to eliminate or figure out if it's strep bag or not. But, again, there's different approaches, but we start with a biplate only because we want to get the mechanisms in place really simple first. If uh, a herd, and, and there are certainly commercially available, would rather try the triplates, that's fine. Uh, my only concern with some of the plates that have selective media in them is that um, uh, at times some of the normal pathogens or looking at the colony types that, that you would see in everyday blood auger don't quite come out or grow as well. Um, and, and I see, I know of a couple uh, places, one vet clinic in particular, that their tech has been culturing and they struggled a little bit with the selective media, um, just recognizing some colonies. Now, like anything else, you practice it, you get good at it, um, you'll, you'll learn it. My, my other suggestion is if you're going to play the game, uh, I would definitely get something like the NMC uh, laboratory guidebook to uh, drive you because it, that's a great resource to better understand the bugs but also uh, the different kind of colony formations you may see. Okay, thank you. We have another question. What are your thoughts on the new DNA diagnostic tests for both individual and bulk tank? Right, and I believe that, yeah, so probably meaning the PCR. Um, we have tested some of those uh, here in Michigan. Uh, Antel Bio, uh, the DHI lab in Michigan, is uh, offering those. I know in other places in the country, in Canada as well. Uh, my take on those right now is they are, I think, reliable. They do find, uh, if you will, little bits and pieces of the DNA uh, for these bacteria. I have, uh, uh, or my feeling is they have uh, value right now to help determine, be it at a bulk tank, uh, that you have, let's stay with contagious pathogens for a minute, like staph aureus or mycoplasm in the herd, or an individual cow uh, that can get a little pricey on an individual cow basis. So perhaps uh, what we've been doing for mycoplasma is pooling them together, five cows at a time. If one of the pooled samples comes up positive, then we might do individual cows. Where I have right now, where I struggle with these tests is with environmental um, bacteria. I really don't know, just as I would routine culture just about, I, I have very little, um, I don't know what to make of if I find uh, bits of E. coli DNA in a bulk tank or in a cow. I don't know if that's from contamination. I don't know uh, what that means to uh, relative um, likelihood that she's infected. Nobody has really studied the strength of these tests, uh, you know, the, the uh, number of um, cycles. The fewer the cycles, the stronger the test. No one has really tried to make a correlation between that and either the sensitivity or specificity of the test or the likelihood that cow's infected, or if you're doing a bulk tank, if the stronger test means more infected cows. Uh, so I guess, I guess to sum it up, I'm leaning more as it is a tool uh, for, I, I believe, more in the contagious pathogen arena, the strep bag, staph aureus, mycoplasma, 
I really don't know what to make of those for the environmentals right now. Okay. Um, another question we have is um, if you could talk a little bit about treatment strategies against Staph aureus and what's the cure rate of the type of treatment that you might uh, suggest. Right. So uh, there have been some studies. It's not the old rule, once a Staph aureus cow, always a Staph aureus cow, uh, is not correct. Uh, it will have a lot to do. The, the single biggest thing is what you will employ to find these cows, the infected cows, as early as you can, whether you use uh, cell count information or uh, other, other means, electroconductivity uh, or conductivity if you're in a robot or something. Uh, needless to say, the, the fresher or the more recent the infection, the much better chance you'll have of treating that infection. The best studies, clinical trials we've run, and some of the other research reports would suggest you might bet uh, roughly a third, but that's going to depend on, again, the duration. One opportunity you do have is to treat with extended therapy or extended therapy before the cow dries off and then treat her as a dry cow. I would say in many cases 20 to 30, 35 percent of uh, cows will cure as a dry period. There are opportunities to treat cows with systemic drugs as a dry cow, uh, but I should caution you not to use drugs that are not approved for um, lactating cattle. Now, that would include Mycotil and Draxin because they stay in the cow for a long time. Oxytet may have uh, potential, but this is extra-label drug use, uh, especially if you extend the therapy for several days, and that's something that you've got to bring your vet into the picture. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions here, and I don't see anybody else uh, typing right at the moment, so I think you must have answered all our questions, Ron. Well, or at least any that they really care to ask. So, <laughs> so I guess with that, um, I just want to thank you again, Ron, for um, taking time today to share your knowledge, and I want to thank the audience, too, for uh, participating in the discussion. Happy to participate, and certainly we know that uh, with the FDA survey coming down the road, it's kind of on everybody's minds.